Hey, it's The Brights coming to you live from our studio kitchen, which we're not going to be staying for much longer because we're transitioning over to our, our new studio, right? Yes. Down the hall. So we want to shout out to John and Denise for helping us with that. And we also want to shout out to Juan and Christina for giving us a hand and yes. helping us put all this together. Yeah, we have some awesome people that are uh, sewing into our ministry that want that um, enjoy the videos and that are wanting to help us to, to make them better. So pretty soon we'll be coming from comfortable art. We got new comfortable chairs that we'll be sitting on in our new office. And um, we also have furniture coming and some equipment. Some other people are helping us with some extra professional equipment, so we won't be doing it from our uh, iPhone anymore. And so it's going to be pretty great. So every week I think we say that we had a whirlwind week. And this week, again, we had a whirlwind week. But I just want to say kudos to my husband because this week he finished the flip house. How many flip houses is that now that you've done? Like five? I think like I think. five. So he finished the flip house. He's been working on it for like eight months. And he's been doing it kind of on the side while he does other jobs. We finally got back into our house after the flood. And then he took on a flip house. So got that finished. People don't know that we actually work for a living <laughs> other than doing this. And uh, so he did that, and then... Hey, uh, so kudos to you for holding the fort down while I'm yeah, doing all that it's stuff. It's a lot, it's a lot of stuff. keeping our ministry going, Keeping too. stuff going. And it's like we have full two full-time <laughs> jobs. And also, then this week, my sister I thought Wallace, you said I was a full-time job, too. Yeah, you're a full-time. So we, you have But three. it used to be a full-time project, so now it's just a full-time job. So <laughs> I, I'm yes, a lot Yes, I'm not a project anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm just happier. a job. <laughs> uh, and then, so we had to go out of town for a funeral. That's sad. And, and uh, we got back on Friday... I left a funeral, drove back into Houston, went to a big marriage retreat we had this weekend with hundreds of people that came from all wow. over the country. And that was amazing. We got to do our comedy on Friday night, do a little emceeing, Saturday do a session. I mean, it was just nonstop. And then we did a class today a and great, then a pre-marriage class today. I learned great some conference. stuff. You know, even as teachers, we think sometimes that uh, we've got it all down and we figured it all out. And, you know, we have a couple that's been married 38 years that uh, were also teaching at the conference. And... They said that they still learn every day. They still yeah, learn every yeah. day after 38 years of marriage that they still want to know each other and learn each other. And I was all like, what? You mean after 38 years, you don't have it figured out yet? We arrive. We gotta, you mean we have to work on our marriage every day? But yes, we do. We yeah. have to put something into it. Otherwise, it will naturally, nat the natural progression of marriage is to get worse. Yeah, it's to it, isolate, you know. like we talked about a couple weeks ago. And, and I don't mean to sound bad, like, know, oh, it's negative. going to be worse. It, but if you don't do something every day to, to sustain your marriage and to grow your marriage, it will, over time, get worse because isolation sets in, <laughs> resentment sets in. And it doesn't just happen like all of a sudden you don't go to resenting your husband or wife just right overnight, it's a little bit, little bit, yeah. little bit until it's it's big. It's just a know? natural tendency. We did a yeah. whole uh, Married Life Live about two weeks about isolation, and it's just one of those little creepy things that kind of starts creepy. It's creepy, but it's also creeps, and it starts small, and then before you know it, you're isolated, and you don't even realize you've got this you know space between you. Uh, and so last week, we apologized for not doing our Married Life Live. I think it's only like the second time we haven't done it since we started back in... October, but I had the flu and it was not pretty. So I don't care, no amount of makeup. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't even uh, hardly even talk. But we're a bit I'm better now. So today we're going to talk about um, tending to the soul of your marriage because we talked to a lot of couples uh, that have things going on in their marriage where they, they're they always trying to fill it with these voids. They're filled the void with things like shopping. Well, I, or I, sports. I think the world, and you know, when, when we, we talk using these. Christian terms and church terms like the world and when you live in the world or and in you know, your flesh. or in your flesh or are you know have you been saved and you know just things like that we some forget. people forget we forget sometimes that like what do they mean by in the world and in the flesh uh, the world standards is different and and it should be different the than God than the than God's standards okay because um, God's standards are different so the the world standards are man when you get married. You should be marrying your soulmate. Mm -hmm. That man, when y'all get married, all the problems that you have, everything that's coming against you, and all the inequities that you feel, and all of the hurts and pains that you feel, and from your past and other relationships, man, when you get married, they're all gonna go away. 
or that person is going to fill that void yeah. for you. And it's like your soulmate. And, you know, you see the movies and they talk about soulmate. But the Bible doesn't actually talk about a soulmate. The Bible, you know, we, he talk, the Bible says about becoming one. And so it's about cultivating your soulmate. We're, none of us are exactly the same. We don't really have a soulmate because if we were the same, we wouldn't need each other. So I know with Richard and I, we're probably the most polar opposites in almost every every uh, aspect, aspect of, of our life. life and we still make it and we still have joy and we can still keep going and we still rub each other the wrong way and we still argue and we still have problems but we still move forward and we find the joy and the goodness in each other not sometimes not right off the bat some things have taken years but a lot of the things that we dealt with was um, that that hole in our life that we tried to fill with drugs we tried to fill with alcohol we tried to fill it with uh, shopping, we tried to fill it with making more money, we tried to eating, fill it with going with... eating, trips, I mean, anything you name, we were trying to fill this void that we had in our life. And we talked to a lot of couples that have that same same issue. There's all these things that they're dealing with, but they and they that, but they don't want to deal with that, that one thing that we talk about, which is the tending to the soul of their marriage, which is the most important part. A lot of times in life nowadays is people have that superficiality, you know, because we live in the world of social media and everything looks so perfect and, and we just have the superficial um, uh, sure. level of our marriage that we're living in and it's, and it's, and we try to cure that or make a restless marriage cured with superficial things. Right. We met with a couple that has been married uh, quite a few years and they thought everything was good in their marriage until they came to a marriage conference and we were talking this past conference and we were just talking about what happens in a marriage of feelings emotions resentments isolation we kind of covered the gamut because we did a, a, a conference on communication and when they left they're like we've got some stuff that's messed up in our marriage and they didn't even realize that. And they came and they went back yeah. to their hotel room. Uh, we talked to her a long time today. They went back to their hotel room and had a big fight last night because they didn't even realize they were having issues in their marriage until they really got deep and got off that surface level and got to that next level. Um, that's, that superficiality is like a curse for marriages. It's, it, can, it can really, um, when there's no growth in your marriage, um, and you're just going through the motions of it, it you know, it's a, it's a real killer. And because eventually you try just, to fill it with you know, other things. Like day by day by day, and it's just, it just seems like it's dragging on, and it's going to be like this for the rest of our life, mm -hmm. you know, and it's and I just think a season. People try to fill it with glitzy things and glamorous things, and, uh, you know, I mean, we love to have fun. We, we love to go do things. Richard and I, both of our second uh, love language is quality time, so we love to go do things, but we, have, we always try to be careful not to just add things for excitement's sake, you know, not more glitz or activity or trips or shopping just because we're trying to fill an empty hole. We want to make sure that, that we do that for fun, but that's not filling the hole that we need to be feeling that's our that's I'm that sure is a nice purse you got yesterday i did get a nice purse <laughs> uh that god filled hole that only god can fill <laughs> and a coach purse cannot fill <laughs> and only because my girlfriend works at coach and she gets me 65 <laughs> that's the only reason because i'm too cheap uh so there is out there um, so the soul of your marriage, it just yearns for more depth. Yeah. That's pretty much what it is. And so for us, we needed to come up with something because after a few years of being marriage, when the newness started to wear off and the, the, um, the tingles started to wear off and we started really getting on each other's nerves and it, and it wasn't just about all this lusty thing anymore. And and all the things that attracted me to her were now, I was resenting all the things that at first were just man, she's got this, she's organized, she's this, she's that. It just started to get on my nerves. Yeah. The same things that attracted me to her yeah. were the same things that drove me crazy and, about her. And vice versa. So he was so self-assured and I loved it. And then he was so self-assured that I couldn't stand it because I thought, he's so self-assured, he's just going to leave me. Like he, like I, I just felt insecure around him all the time. So we were all, so we had this life, we have the kids, we're trying to fill it with stuff, we're trying to, we looked really good on the outside, but we just had this hole in our heart uh, or in our life that we didn't know how to fill. And so for us, we had to get something with meaning and purpose. And f so there's three things that they say, there's three classic disciplines, I guess, which is for um, your spiritual life. And the first thing is, is going to church. You know, and people that go to church are like, well, I already go to church, awesome. But the people that don't go to church, that are watching this video are like, I don't need to go to church. You know, I've been hurt in church, or I don't need to go to church. I love the Lord, I pray. But there's something about going to the house of the Lord. There's just something about, the Bible talks about gathering together. You know, there's something about that community and about having those friends. And that's you know, I want to speak a little bit about people who get hurt in church. Um, 
I felt that when I was younger, that kind of happened to me because when my dad had died, my mom, we grew up Catholic and my mom, we had no money. We were so poor. Um, and I mean, we were so poor, we could only afford, afford one O in poor. <laughs> I mean, we were poor. Oh. And she went down and talked to the Catholic Church, and they said, well, because you married a divorced man who was not a Catholic, we never recognize your marriage as being uh, a, a legal marriage in the eyes of God, so there's nothing we can do for you. And I remember my mom coming home because she would go to church every Sunday, go to Mass, do all the things that she was supposed to do, and when she needed the church, they weren't there. And I remember seeing that, and I see her, I remember her crying, and it just hurt me to my core. And I and said, you're you know like what? 17, right? Yeah, I was 17. And I go, see, that's what your God does. And I remember that happening. But we need, and that's what the enemy wanted. And because of that, it kept me out of church until I was 39 years old. And then when I met Richard at 39 and I tried to get him to go to church, he was like, oh, I'm not going to church. I don't give my money to, to rich pastors and this and that. And then he goes, I, I, I know all about God. I love God, but I don't have to go to church. And he started convincing me I didn't need to go to church. But, but I had grown up going to church and I went to the Episcopal church. So it was more of like religion to me than it was really a relationship with God. But I still, that, that still, for me, it's all I knew. I still needed that. I still yearned for that, that God filled thing that only God could fill. And I didn't even know you could have it to a whole another level when you got a relationship with God. But just to me, even just walking in that church building, that reverence of God did something for me. Uh, and so when we started attending church together uh, and just dedicating that yeah, one. I was scared. I was nervous. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. Yeah, I forgot. All those part, things, right? you know. So um, didn't want to be there. Didn't feel like I deserved to be there. Didn't feel you like know? we fit in. I didn't sure. fit in because that's where all the good people were. And I had, I had done so much bad in my life. But man, God didn't want me there. And that's the, the lie that the enemy tells you to keep you from the person and the thing that's going to save you yeah. uh, and to help you get through all of these. We're not going to be able to do it on our own, folks. I mean, we just can't. I've tried over and over many, many times, going to different meetings, going to different associations, getting pl doing different, and it just never did work for me mm -hmm. uh, until I had my own relationship that I could just go to God the Father myself and just talk to him one-on-one -on -one and ask him to, to, to help me in things in my and life. I, and I think it's also finding a church that is a loving church that has, that's not a judgy church. You know, and it doesn't mean that they don't, they don't uh, speak the truth in love and that they don't correct people in the way that they need to be corrected to live the way God says. But if you go to a church where you just feel condemned, it's not where you need to be. Not for us. It wasn't for us. We, when we first went to Lakewood, and Lakewood wasn't even like that, but when we went there, we had so much on us that we, we were so fake when we went there at first. We were just living this very superficial. We didn't even, they didn't know we were partying at home and doing all these things. We, but we lived very superficially because we didn't want to, we thought we had to fit in and be, you know, Christ-like to be able to go to church. So we started going, and but after a while, you know, God started working on our heart and we got to get real and, and let all that kind of, that guard down. But there was something about going to church once a week, dedicating that one day a week. It still is for us, 15 years later, going to church um, changed our life. You know, for you know? all those naysayers out there, I'm going to throw this challenge at you. The only reason I went to church was to prove to my wife that it didn't work. Tell them I went really to went. hustle. Well, I went to hustle some Christians and I went to hustle God. <laughs> and in the end, God hustled me and I became friends with a bunch of good people, uh, people that really cared about my life, really cared about my soul. And, you know, that wanted to help me out of the dark pit mm -hmm. that I had put myself in, that I could not crawl out no matter how hard I tried. And also when you work hard, I know for us, we work hard the other six days of the week. Like there's a, it's a grind. There's a lot of a, a push for productivity and we've got all these things and we're, and we're just, I mean, we're like workaholics. And so that one day to go to church is so refreshing to us to be able to refresh our soul, to be able to see our friends that are like-minded, that have the same, uh, same values and goals, that have the same feeling about marriage that we do, that they want their marriage to be strong and to be trustworthy and good and to be Christ-like that it's good to be around those kind of people because it just builds us up and it refuels us, you know? Um, it's partly social, but it's also a spiritual place that we get to go hear the message, get to hear a word, something that we need. It gives us more ammunition. And I always say, what is that thing called? The quiver? 
you know, like has all the arrows in it. It's just like you're putting arrows in your quiver for the week because as soon as Monday comes, all that stuff that you heard on Sunday, if you don't have some stuff in there, some ammunition, it's hard. And it's not just about going to church on Sunday. I mean, that is so great. And to, for us, it's, it's just um, it like the start. music and the worship. But then we also have the other six days of the week that we have to make sure that we read some word, that we study, we have a devotional, we listen to Christian TV or something, just to kind of keep hearing that word because it's easy as humans to have be, I mean, we get emotional and we're all pumped up Man, on Sunday. We could, we could Monday, be in church on Sunday and, and be right back in the natural yep. on Monday. Actually, sometimes Sunday afternoon when you leave church, Man, you get right to back into it. From church, you know? um, but we, it was before we had... And, you know, the more we went, the more we got stronger and the more we learned about forgiveness and grace. And it was just easier to, to be able to push through. And it's easier things. to address issues and to talk about things that are deep rooted in your life. And, you know, at this conference, we really talked about that, that when you get to a, um, a tree and you want to kill a tree, you don't kill the tree by cutting the branches off. You cut the branches off, the branches grow back. Mm -hmm. You have to get to the root. You have to get to the root of the problem. If you want the tree to grow, you don't pour water on the branches. You pour water on the root. Everything comes from the root. And a lot of this thing, all, a lot of these things that we're dealing with and the iniquities of our life have all stemmed from childhood. The way we were raised, the way our parents talked to us, the way we were disciplined, the way others were disciplined us, the way we went to school, teachers, uh, friends, past relationships, all of this molds who we are yeah and matter of fact we were just talking about doing a video about just about that about things in our childhood and how it affects our marriage and I think that we should probably we're gonna research a little bit more because we we talk about it a lot ourselves but we just want to make sure that we're bringing it in a way because it's some deep stuff and and but we do want to talk about that um, they also say sur surveys say that couples who go to church together even if it's as little as once a month those that uh, that are uh, increases their chances to be married for life. People that actually go to church together, even if they go as little as once a month. I so if you, you go four times better. a week, I mean, four times a week. If you go four times a month, just imagine what that does for your marriage. What were you gonna I say? thought you were going to say have a better sex life, and I was going to say, that's, that's say we got to go. I got to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so it says couples that uh, worship together feel better about their marriage than couples that don't worship together. So they actually I know have, that to be psychologically true. feel better about their marriage. I know that to be true because mm -hmm. I remember when we were going to church and we weren't praying with each other. I remember how I felt. And then I remember how I felt when we were going to church and we were praying together. And, and just the intimacy that that builds that so many couples don't know and they're missing out on. And they're just at a place where they're afraid to be vulnerable with each other. And prayer is extremely vulnerable. It's yeah, extremely right. intimate. Yes, yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay. And so being going to the actual church building, and I have friends that go, oh, I go to the church at the great outdoors. And they're like, we just, we're, you know, we're very naturey, and we just pray to God out, out, you know, out in the universe. That's awesome. But there's something about walking through those church doors and, and just connecting with other people and being with the body of Christ. There, there just is. Um, and just to stand before God, the God of the universe, to be able to stand before him, it makes you want to be better and to grow. It does, it does for me. I mean, it does for us, I think. And worshiping is sexy. You know, it's sexy to watch my husband worship. When he praises the Lord, let me just say, when I know my, my husband is connected to God, I know he's praying, I know that he's got word in him, and I see him worshiping, I feel protected and secure because that's a woman's number one need is security. Emotional Ooh, security. somebody testified. Can I get security. an amen up so in the when house? when he does that, I'm just like, baby, mm, I'm sorry, Lord, it's in church, but... But, hey, he created it and we're married. So I, it just feels sexy to me. I don't know. All right. And ladies, what do y'all think? Because I think ladies feel the same way. Because I heard it at the retreat the other day, and all the ladies were like, yeah, they were whoop whooping, you know. All right. Time uh, to go worship. Okay. Uh, get your worship on. Uh, so the other thing, another spiritual um, or another discipline is to fill that God-filled hole is to uh, serve, is to, to have service. And uh, it just feels good to help people, right? Yeah, it does. I mean, I didn't know that at first. When I first started going, and, and first off, just going to church for me took an act of God because I just didn't want to go. I went. I was the, actually the last one probably in and the first one out. And that was just me because I didn't feel that I was wanted there. <coughs> These are all preconceived notions that I had, all lies from Satan to keep me. He wanted to keep me out of the house of God because he knew that I was going to get healed there, and he knew that I was going to find out what he truly was there. And, and when we started going to church, it was good to go to church, but after a while, it wasn't enough for us to just go to church on Sunday. Like we, we, God started pulling us other places and we had to, we wanted to, to, 
to do more. We had to get our focus off each other and all of our stuff we were doing to each other and the strife and the poking and the just it was so selfish it was just about what our needs were and when we took our focus off ourselves and we put it on helping other people and we did it as a team that really changed things and it just helped a lot of that mm. um that selfishness so I there think. was a process that happened when we first got together it was basically a relationship of lust and carnal wantings and just in the flesh which is in the natural and once that started to wear off and we started to go to church well, then we started to have issues. We started, we weren't working through them. We were just, it was all, everything that we had pressed down for our whole life, all the emotions, all the hurts, all the pains, all the resentments that we just buried start coming to life in church. It starts to come back out because God doesn't want that stuff pressed down and not dealt with. He wants to bring it up so that we can deal with it. And it, it, we started to volunteer yeah. because we thought, well, that's going to help. Well, it did because it got us off of talking about our issues, and we just started volunteering. But eventually, we got stronger in our volunteering, and then the issues that would come back up, we would start dealing with it. So it wasn't that we just went to church and got whole and fixed. We there was a process serving. that we had but to But I'll tell you the really slippery slope with that serving thing. Like for us, when we first started serving, it was great. It took the focus off each other. It made us feel like we were part of something bigger. But then it became very overwhelming and it became where it was eating up a lot of our life and we were volunteering for everything. Anything we could do to not deal with our own yeah. issues at home. So be careful with that. Yeah, so be real careful. And we see people and they're leaders in the church and they're doing all these things, but they're not dealing with at home. So you've got to make sure that we're, you know, you've got to be able to have that communication. You know, are we okay? Are we putting our, our energies into something else when we should be putting it into home? It, our life has to be balanced. Our marriage has to be balanced. If God was sitting here right with us right now, he wouldn't say, oh, no, Richard, you need to put the church before you put your wife and your family. You need to go serve and take care of those people in that church before, and then come home and take care of your family. Right. He would say, take care of your family first. This is your first ministry. Home is your first ministry. And then you can go out and help the world and do things. But and, and once you get this good, once you have this good with you and God and then this is good, then you can go out and you're overflow. You're working in the overflow and you can start helping other people. God gives you a supernatural um I don't know, like you have more Man, more you have more energy. zeal, more <laughs> zest for life. I mean, I, I cannot wait to go to sleep, to wake up, to see the goodness that God has for me that day. I mean, being so content in our life where we are right now, it, 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 it's mind-boggling because I never thought that I could have a life like mm -hmm. this without the drugs, the alcohol, and the pornography, and all the sin in the world. I thought, no, you got to have that. That's the fun stuff. No, that's just the lie that covers up the real, true, fun stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and and you get a different when you're doing when you're operating in God's world, like in God's uh, currency or whatever. I guess I don't know. You have more. He gives you grace for things that other people are like. I don't even know how y'all do it. I mean, sometimes we don't know how we do it, but I know it's God because we could not do this in our own natural strength. It's just like God gives us an extra oomph to do these things that are for God because and we, we have used it. to hear that in church. Oh, when you serve God, he will, and you need strength. He will give you extra strength. You will and run I'm and thinking, not faint. You will, yeah, you will run and not grow weary. You will run and not fall. And I'm thinking, you will rise up like eagles. I am so tired. How do we do this? But he gives you this supernatural mm -hmm. adrenaline yep. that when you're working to serve him and to serve your family and to serve one another, he just does something in your soul that mends and, 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 and heals all that brokenness that we've had and we've carried our whole entire life that's caused us to go from husband to husband to husband or wife to wife to wife and never find joy and contentment with the person that we're with. And, and Barbara's saying thank you. She's learning so much. Thank you all you for listening and thank you for encouraging Barbara, us. Barbara, you're it awesome, us, by the yes, way. keeps us going. And so you might go uh, serve in church. You don't necessarily have to serve at church. I mean, that's not where we started serving. We started serving at our kids' school. Yeah, we didn't feel like we were, well, we couldn't even serve at church first because we were still living together. So they didn't really want us <laughs> serving at church yet. Doesn't look but, good for the church. Yeah. Uh, but we were, um, we were, we started volunteering at the kids in their school, like junior and achievement. food pantries. And, and little things like that on holidays. We did it, you know, just so it looked good on Facebook. Uh, and we did <laughs> stuff like that at first. But then we started becoming scout leaders and we really started enjoying serving people. Like, like that became bigger 
I don't even know how to explain it, but it just feeds you in a way that's it's that God, God-filled hole that starts to get filled that you just, um, and there's something about doing it together uh, that uh, when you work as a team. And we see mm-hmm. people in church sometimes, and, and one's in the ministry of the kids, and one's in music, and, and that's awesome. But when you can work together in a ministry and work as a team, and get that focus off each other and on other people, it just bonds you. It I gives think, that compassion and intimacy with other people. You know, we were really directed into marriage ministry because it seems like and you hear this a lot that wherever you're hurting then that's where you need to sow a seed in other words that's where you need to plant some time that's where you need to put your uh, a focus on and so when god started to heal our marriage and we started to think wow we had this completely wrong and we had we were doing it so hard the wrong way that man it's not so it's not easy but it's simple to do it the right way and God can turn this our marriage around, and He started to do that. And I'm like, well, if He's doing it, and we would talk like if He if, he if He's do doing this for us, He can do it for other people, people like that aren't so jacked up, you know. <laughs> and you know, I'll just be super straight up on us. When we first started serving at church, I did it manipulatively, if that's a word, because it was the only way I knew Richard. One of our both of our strengths is in influencing. So, but we like to be part of stuff and be part of you know. It's just how we are. We always have our finger in the pot. But when I saw him serving and wanting to do it and in the marriage ministry, he kept going to the classes and the retreats and the workshop. I was like, hmm, this is a good way to get him to go. And at the same time, he's going to learn some stuff and maybe it would heal our marriage. So that's kind of how it started going. I was like kind of tricking him into Jesus, you know, trying to get him to go. But once we did start going, you know, the Bible, the word doesn't fall in deaf ears and it did start to, to change our hearts. And also what we saw was our kids started changing because they grew up watching their parents serve and then our kids started serving in church and our kids still serve in church both of our daughters serve at their ch- at church um, our, our youngest daughter just moved to south carolina to john grace church because she just wants to serve and she just loves the lord she learned you know she's saying she sent all me a text today my daughter sent me a text and said dad i just want to say thank you for going to church and letting god turn your life around and Aww. that meant so much to me you yeah. know and uh they're watching and it matters you know it really does matter and you don't always have to serve in public for people to see some of our best things that we've done serving others is things that we've done as a couple that we agreed on to help somebody to serve in private that nobody will ever know god only knows and but those kind of things are really cool too is to be able to, to you do know, that I, and i want to challenge you guys something to to find a ministry and make something else bigger than your marriage you know put something our marriage ministry is bigger than us we want to find something we want to be a small part of something big and we want to let people know that marriage is the best thing it's the closest thing to heaven and God Mm -hmm. himself is marriage he created marriage so that we would be one with him and of course if you can't recognize it now the enemy is attacking marriage and relationship he wants you to go from person to person to person so that you never get that deep intimacy that God wanted you to have and he makes it look like something else is always better and the and grass not, is always greener. And not. if you weren't with this person, then somebody else would understand you. It's not true. Y'all, it's not true. I've been married. It's my third time. I've been married. I know. I mean, I always say that I love weddings. I love marriage because I've been the star of three of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that way, joke about it. But truthfully, the, it's, the enemy's a liar. <laughs> and he yeah. just wants you to think that it's going to be better on the other side. And it's not. You've got to work on this. God's going to keep letting you go around He's that same mountain until you get it. Right? Uh, and then the third discipline, as far as feeling that God-filled hole, is prayer. And we've had a, we've done videos, a whole video on prayer before. But surveys show that people that pray together are the happiest. Married couples that they, when they survey married couples, the couples that pray together are the couples that uh, say that they are the happiest. So that's I, I thought that was really cool. I like that. Yeah, and so I know for us, and they describe their their marriage as being more romantic and more intimate and they have better sex lives 90 percent of them say that they have better sex lives so when you pray together you stay together he goes i gotta go pray right now we have to go pray (laughs) and y'all want to know something else if your kids aren't close your kids ears right now women are are, tend to be more orgasmic with husbands that pray with them what yeah and that's good info man (laughs) Um, and it's not easy to pray together i mean for us it wasn't easy because it wasn't something natural for us it's very vulnerable a lot of people don't like to pray because they're like wow i gotta put my heart out there for this person and how are they gonna 
you know, are they going to judge me? Are they going to to accept me? Are they going to think I'm weird because are they, they going to tell my... their friends or their father yeah. or their brothers or sisters? Are they going to is it safe? So or and sometimes prayer becomes like first for us it was more of a preaching session. We were kind of preaching at each other. And, um, you know, we didn't want to do that either. So we kind of learned this when we started. <laughs> so doing... my first prayer was kind of like, oh, Lord, please let Sherry see that it's okay for me to hang out with my bros and have a few cold ones and smoke a little spleef. Because, man, we're not hurting anybody, <laughs> you know, Lord. All these new words every you know, time. You know, spleef? I've never even heard of Pot. That. Ganja. <laughs> Mary heard. Jane. Okay, I know some man. of those, but I've never heard spleef before. <laughs> I'm so old. Um, they probably don't even call it that anymore. No. Anyways, so, but that's how we used to praying pray. Praying is very we didn't vulnerable. Know. It has a high price, but it's worth the price. And um, we learned how to, for us to pray where, where we could finally get past that part of being awkwardness was to, to start praying, just being thankful in our prayers, to have prayers of thanksgiving. And when we started just thanking God, we just started, when we, we started out still, we started out thanking God and we can thank God for 30 minutes, just thanking him for all the things in our life. And it's all about perspective. You know, you start thinking, we don't really just take, come to God with all these issues. I mean, we do come to him with things that are on our heart, but we're not like, oh, and we want this kind of car and we want this and this new thing. It's not, our prayers aren't even like that. It's our prayers are, are thanking him mostly, but also praying for our children and their hearts and wanting them to serve the Lord. Praying and, for you guys, praying yeah, for and other praying people for other and, and, and praying for marriages. Oh, that was me. Praying for <laughs> marriages and praying for healing. And um, I mean, it, it's just, we love to do that. Yeah. That's just something that we love to do. And there's not a right or wrong way to pray. Just pray. Just start Amen. out with the Lord's Prayer, but pray together. So the three disciplines to fill that God, God-shaped hole uh, in your life is to have to worship together, to go to church, uh, to serve together in some capacity, whether it's at church or in your community, and then also to pray together. And those three things will take your level from that superficial level into that deeper level. So if it's that one thing, you're like, yeah, we, we really have a pretty good marriage, we love each other, but there's just something missing. It's just that something, and you just feel that unrest all the time. That restlessness of marriage is usually because you're operating in a superficial a superficial level. That's good. Yep. So we hope that it's helping y'all. We're only gonna be in this kitchen for a couple more sessions because uh, the, the, um, we'll show everybody coming, the new the studio furniture's coming. soon. People have been really pouring into our ministry, so we're super excited, and it's going to be really cute. And hopefully, we'll have a lot better. Uh, so everything. we pray for you guys. We're going to ask you this: pray for us. Yeah. Pray that we reach more more couples in need. Uh, pray that we reach couples that are in good place in their marriage, and it goes to a better place. And take us to couples who are about to get divorced, so that we can help them. Yeah. Pray for that. We want to meet the people that are turned from Jesus and turned from the Lord and about to file for divorce and, and they're hurting, we want to help those couples. That's who we want to reach. Because we were one of those couples. We were one and of we those know couples. that it can be so much better. Yeah. And so just help help us by sharing our videos. Just tell people about it and um, let us know if you have anything on your heart that you want us to talk about. Send us a message. We'd love to hear about it. So we love you guys and um, what does it say? Share the video, friend. Thank you. And do watch parties. I don't even still know what a watch party is, but I know some people do them, and they get to get their friends to watch them, and I think that's pretty cool. So we appreciate y'all. We love you. We pray for you every single day, and we'll see you next Sunday. All right. Love y'all. Bye.